somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Et qui défendait la liberté d'expression. The moment you limit free speech is not free speech. Somebody will say, oh, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. These are foolish people. Welcome to Clear and Present Danger, a history of free speech by Jakob Mshengama. Clear and Present Danger relies on the generous support of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, Fridor, and the Politiken Foundation. Episode 2, Liberty or License. Before we begin, let me just give a huge thanks to the literally thousands of folks out there in dozens of countries across all continents who chose to listen to the first episode. Believe me when I say that we do not take your precious time and attention for granted. I was especially happy to see listeners from countries where free speech is denied or in retreat. It's great to have penetrated the Great Firewall in China and to have a surprisingly big audience in Turkey. Most listeners, though, are here in the US with downloads in all 50 states, which feels extra good now that I've moved here. So let me take this opportunity to ask you for help. As you may have noticed last episode, we use sound effects for lengthy quotes. Some find it great and innovative, others find it cheesy. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the effects. Should we use it or lose it? Let me know on Facebook or email. And now, on to the action. Last episode, we covered the birthplace of free speech and democracy in ancient Athens. In today's episode, we'll see what role free speech played for the Romans who became the masters of Greece. But first, I need to make a very short detour to sketch some crucial events that happened elsewhere in the time period covered by this episode. In the 3rd century BC, King Ashoka waged a brutal campaign of conquest in present-day India when he suddenly got moral scruples. Buddhism showed him a different way and he issued a number of edicts inscribed on stone pillars. They included what may be the world's first declaration of full religious tolerance. This tolerance was built on restraint in speech, that is, not praising one's own religion or condemning the religion of others without good cause. But despite the call for self-censorship, Ashoka's tolerance acknowledged the worth of other religions and was far ahead of his time. The first such edict in the West would have to wait another 500 years. Around the same time, the Emperor Qin Shi Huang, sorry for the pronunciation, unified China. But he was not big on alternative views. So in 213 BC, he ordered the burning of books on history, poetry and philosophy. This may have been the first organized mass burning of books in recorded history. But as we shall see, certainly not the last. And two centuries later, the first emperor of Rome would copy his Chinese counterpart. In one version of events, Qin also buried 460 Confucian scholars alive, lest anyone should be in doubt that he was serious. To those eager for more on developments outside the West, it's coming up. Next episode will also deal with the Roman Empire, but much of the action will take place in the Middle East and North Africa. And in episode 5, we'll head further into the Middle East and Central Asia. The Roman Republic lasted some 500 years. And when transformed into an empire, the western half lasted an additional 500 years. The east, almost a thousand. I'll focus on the general conception of free speech during the Republic and how it was used and abused by Roman greats like Cicero, Caesar and Cato. 
Then I'll try to show how free speech was affected by the violent collapse of the Republic and the emergence of the autocratic empire under Augustus, ending with the paranoid Tiberius. Of course, I'll have to omit much context and many decisive moments and characters. But freespeechhistory.com has a lot of references that provide a much fuller picture than the narrow lens of free speech. The Roman Republic was allegedly established in 509 BC when the Romans expelled their last king and swore never to be ruled by a king again. In other words, the Roman Republic is just one or two years older than the Athenian democracy, at least according to the Romans' own patriotic myths. We get more solid evidence around 450 BC, when basic laws of the early Republic were codified in the Twelve Tables, which also touches on free speech. And the first Republicans were both pretty thin-skinned and heavy-handed. Take the seventh table. When anyone publicly abuses another, or writes a poem for the purpose of insulting him, or rendering him infamous, he shall be beaten with a rod until he dies. Obviously, the early Romans didn't teach their kids the old rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me. But the law went into disuse until revived by Augustus. The Roman political system was extremely complicated and changed over time, so I'll only mention those parts of the system I think are most important for free speech. For the first couple of centuries, Roman citizens, or free Roman males, basically consisted of two groups. On top, a dominant nobility of patricians, and below them, plebeians, or plebs, of humble birth. Only patricians had the power to elect and be appointed consuls, the most powerful political office of the Republic. And the Twelve Tables prohibited intermarriage, barring the plebs from social mobility. According to tradition, the plebs got fed up, downed tools, and organized a number of strikes and mutinies known as the conflicts of the orders in the 5th and 4th centuries. Think of it as the first successful instance of civil disobedience by quote-unquote democracy activists in the history of mankind. It paid off, and the responsibilities of appointing magistrates and ratifying laws were given to popular assemblies. The plebs were also given tribunes, a form of magistrates, that could veto laws and act as a check on the Senate. Great. So now, at last, even the poor Romans could speak truth to power. Well, not really. In the assemblies, it was not one man, one vote. The citizens counted as collecting voting blocks based on tribe or property. In a radical departure from the Greek concept of isagoria, equality of speech, the assemblies were solely convened and addressed by magistrates. Ordinary citizens didn't have the right to speak, so the assembly's role was to affirm, or more rarely, to reject, not to debate. In fact, the Latin word for voting, suffrago, sorry for the pronunciation again, simply means to approve or support. True, prior to assemblies, magistrates could summon a form of town hall meeting called conciones, where they could try and rally support or opposition to whatever was to be voted on in the assembly. But even here, ordinary citizens were barred from speaking, so no real debate took place apart from booing or cheering. In practice, the Senate was the most powerful institution in the Republic. It couldn't pass laws, but it would prepare legislation for the assembly with the expectation that it was ratified. It also had powers over important issues such as foreign affairs. Senators were usually selected from a small and self-perpetuating elite. 
like the related word senile, senate, is derived from the Latin word senex, meaning old man. In other words, a group of old, powerful men at the very heart of Rome's political life. In the Senate, political discussions were free, and the senators would often unload on each other. One senator claimed that as a child, the prominent lawyer and politician Cicero had been collecting clothes stained with sheep dung, pig manure, and human excrement. Still, the Senate followed a strict hierarchical speaking order. The junior senators were called the pedari, derived from the Latin word for feet, as they would silently vote by trudging over to the senator they agreed with. All in all, where the Athenian democracy was bottom-up and deliberative, the Roman Republic was very much top-down with one-sided debate. This elitist model was defended by none other than Cicero, an eloquent, but not always consistent, defender of republican ideals, whom we'll spend more time on in a bit. Cicero loved Greek philosophy and oratory, but Athenian democracy? Not so much. That ancient country, which once flourished with riches and glory, fell owing to that one evil, the immoderate liberty and licentiousness of the popular assemblies. When inexperienced men, ignorant and uninstructed in any description of business whatever, took their seats in the theater, then they undertook inexpedient wars. Then they appointed seditious men to the government of the Republic. Then they banished from the city the citizens who had deserved best of the state. Cicero was no Pericles. He was all in favor of free speech and political liberty, but it had to be exercised within a system where the elite remained in control and tended to the welfare of the Republic on behalf of the lower classes. Sure, the lower classes could vote, and gaining their support was important. But Cicero didn't envisage any real debate between men of rank and the people. So for Cicero, free speech meant first and foremost free speech for the best men in the Senate, not the plebs ready to suck the treasury dry, nor the artisans, shopkeepers, and that scum. But because the sources often reflect the bias of the senatorial classes, we don't know for sure if Cicero's view reflected reality. Maybe the lower classes also cherished and practiced free speech, outside the safe space of the Senate, in places where Cicero and his Senate buddies would have had their toga soiled by the lack of marble floors. So how free were Roman citizens in their daily lives? Liberty, called libertas, would always have a special place in Roman hearts and minds. A free Roman citizen, no matter rank, was not subject to the arbitrary domination of others. The Romans did not know of human rights, but libertas did rust on positive law that protected Roman citizens against arbitrary justice and provided civil rights. Equality before the law was crucial. You couldn't execute a citizen without a trial or pass bill of attainders, and you had a right to protest decisions of magistrates. And of course, libertas also included what limited political freedom ordinary citizens enjoyed through voting in the assemblies. According to the great historian P.A. Brunt, in the late Republic, freedom of philosophical, religious, and even political speculation was unchecked. But crucially, the Romans didn't have a word for free speech similar to the Greek isogoria, equality of speech, or parousia, uninhibited speech. Elements of free speech were simply included in the concept of libertas. Roman free speech would first and foremost be exercised in the Senate, by magistrates before assemblies and conjunas, and by orators before the courts, where, as in Athens, political speech would often be mixed with legal arguments. Men like Cicero and Caesar used oratory to further their political careers. Had Caesar not been a brilliant orator, 
he may not have become a brilliant general or a dictator. The Romans would contrast libertas with licentia or license. Licentia was essentially an abuse of freedom, either illegal or very much frowned upon. And much that constituted parecia in Athens would have been licentia in Rome. What was deemed libertas and what was licentia seemed often to depend on the wealth and status of the speaker and who was on the receiving end. Senators and nobles would subject each other to vicious verbal attacks in the courts and assemblies all the time. But no one would bat an eyelid if the elite vilified the plebs. But if someone of lower rank turned the tables and went after the rich and famous, why then it was licentia. So when in 206 BC the poet Navius attacked the leading men of Rome, much like Aristophanes had done in Athens, he was first thrown in prison and later exiled. In the Middle Republic, from around the mid-3rd century to 133 BC, attitudes towards the Greek philosophy that was spreading among the elite was ambivalent, and on several occasions, philosophers, astrologers, and teachers of rhetoric were shown the city gate. In 155 BC, an Athenian delegation of philosophers arrived in Rome. According to tradition, one of the philosophers, Carneades, the head of the academy in Athens, held two equally brilliant speeches on the issue of justice. In the first speech, he praised justice as an essential value. And the next day, he argued vehemently against the value of justice. Plutarch writes that it so impressed the young men of Rome that Quitting all their pleasures and pastimes, they ran mad, as it were, after philosophy. The deeply conservative Cato the Elder feared the sweet, seductive words of Greek philosophy might corrupt the aristocratic youth and intervened to have the philosophers expelled. But in the late Republic, Greek philosophy, literature and art had penetrated the Roman elite more widely. Rome may have conquered Greece by force, but Greece had conquered Rome through culture that couldn't be deported. One person steeped in Greek culture was the poet Lucretius. He was an Epicurean, a Greek philosophical school that along with Stoicism had been adopted by many well-to-do Romans. Lucretius authored the philosophical long poem on the nature of things, written around the 50s BC. Lucretius writes of an infinite universe with many worlds, the motion of atoms, and indicts established religion as wicked and impious. In one memorable phrase, he writes of When man's life lay for all to see, foully groveling upon the ground crushed beneath the weight of superstition. While not an atheist, Lucretius saw no active role for the gods. Four or five centuries later, such free thinking could well have resulted in the death penalty. How about freedom of religion? Roman society was relatively tolerant of religious diversity, although tolerance as a doctrine is a much later concept. Foreign religions could set up shop and Greek gods were adopted and Romanized. The Roman relationship with the gods worked as a sort of quid pro quo. We sacrifice to you and you ensure our victory in warfare and the general welfare of the community. Maintaining the mutually beneficial peace with the gods, Pax de Orm, was thought essential, so rituals, sacrifices and consultations of the gods were instrumental as part of the political process. But Roman society was not obsessed with the inner beliefs of its citizens, so no inquisition was in place during the Republic. The Latin word pietas, from where we get piety, originally meant the discharge of a social obligation. In other words, religion was mostly concerned with outward acts such as rituals and sacrifice. The Romans did not seek a window into men's souls in order to ensure conformity in belief according to specific orthodox creeds. But if the peace of the gods was upset, 
It would threaten the Republic through the vengeance of angry guards, and that was the limit of toleration. At the end of the 3rd century BC, the Romans fought an existential war against Carthage. The famous general Hannibal invaded Italy with war elephants. And the Second Punic War created waves of refugees who flocked to Rome. Ancient Roman historian Livy recounts how the Forum was filled with new, unruly, superstitious cults promising salvation from the impending doom of Hannibal's juggernaut. This undermined the peace of the gods. The unauthorized religious leaders were promptly ordered to hand over their books and scriptures to a magistrate, and no one was to use any strange or foreign form of sacrifice in any public or consecrated place. Thirty years later, a new moral panic hit Rome. The spread of the Bacchanalia, a cult devoted to Bacchus, god of fertility and wine and all-around good times. According to Livy, the Bacchanalia were engaged in nocturnal debauchery that would make Larry Flint blush. Even more seriously, and perhaps fancifully, they were also behind ritual murders and conspiracy. More than 7,000 were said to have been part of the Bacchanalia, and many of these were sentenced to death or prison. Bacchic temples were destroyed, and Bacchic worship put under strict state control. Why did the Romans react so aggressively? Perhaps there really was a criminal conspiracy. But the Romans may also have worried that the Bacchic priests could wield so much power over their followers that they threatened the stability and authority of the state. It was not so much Bacchus the god as his unruly followers that was the issue. And of course it didn't help that the Bacchanalia had migrated from Greece and thus fed into the anti-Greek sentiments of conservatives like Cato the Elder. A few years later, Greek religious books were also publicly burned. But these were the exceptions to the relatively tolerant Roman attitude to religion. Outbreaks of religious persecutions would have to wait until the Christians entered the stage, as we will see in the next episode. So ordinary Romans did not enjoy Athenian-style equality of speech. But at least they could vote in the assemblies. Yet women were completely cut out of the loop. But like the plebs before them, the women of Rome turned to political activism in what may have been history's first women's march. During the Second Punic War, money was scarce and the Oppian Law was passed in 215 BC. It prohibited Roman women from luxury items, including wearing expensive dresses. After the war, two tribunes proposed repealing the law. The proposal started a tumultuous debate around the Forum. And then women appeared. Livy writes, the matrons could not be kept at home by advice or modesty or their husband's orders, but blocked all the streets and approaches to the forum. The crowd of women grew larger day by day. Soon they dared even to approach and appeal to the consuls, the praetors, and the other officials. I imagine the protesting women must have been led by the real housewives of the Palatine Hill, the posh neighborhood of ancient Rome and home to the rich and famous. The sight and sound of women protesting in public was shocking to many Roman men. Cato the Elder, now a consul, completely lost it, and in the longest of rants he gave a master class in patriarchal misogyny. The lack of discipline would allow liberty in the forum to be crushed and trodden underfoot. He compared the protesting women with the plebs who went on strike during the conflict of the orders. First we had to give in to the poor, and now the women? The horror. Cato finished with a lament on the loss of the good old values. Our ancestors permitted no woman to conduct even personal business without a guardian to intervene on her behalf. They wished them to be under the control of fathers, brothers, husbands. We, heaven help us, 
allow them now even to interfere in the public affairs. Yes, and to visit the forum and our informal and formal sessions. Poor old Cato. He would have felt right at home in modern Saudi Arabia. More and more women arrived, camping outside the home of the swing vote tribunes, until they caved in. And so the Oppian law was repealed. A spectacular political victory for the women of Rome, who had used a collective voice that Rome's constitution formally denied them. Unfortunately for the Romans, conflicts over basic principles would increasingly be solved through violence rather than peaceful protest during the late Republic starting in 133 BC. The end of the Roman Republic is a topic that has received endless attention, and you can see why it has proved such a popular script. The events include war, love and betrayal, and the cast, some of the superstars of antiquity, like Cicero, Julius Caesar, and Octavian, the later Emperor Augustus. It is way outside the scope of this podcast to delve into that wider story. But free speech played a supporting role in the events that led to the death throes of the Republic. I've decided to focus on the role played by Cicero, not only was he the most eloquent practitioner and defender of free speech, even if he added quite a few buts. His fate is also symbolic of how the end of the Republic affected political speech. But before we get to Cicero, we have to provide a bit of context and briefly touch upon events that took place before Cicero was born and while he was a youth. Eighty-four years before Caesar cast the proverbial die and crossed the Rubicon, a tribune called Tiberius Gracchus took up the cause of the poor. Land reform and affordable corn prices were among his demands. But to absolutely no one's surprise, the wealthy landowners in the Senate were dead set against redistribution. And when Tiberius circumvented centuries of legal precedent to ensure his political platform, he and many of his supporters were killed by pro-senatorial forces. According to Plutarch, Tiberius himself was clubbed with the leg of a stool, wearing only his undergarments. The conflict between populists and conservatives, or populares and optimates as the Romans called them, had turned violent. Ten years later, Tiberius' younger brother Gaius would up the ante further. The poor should not just be given more resources. They should have real political power. Gaius was about to go all Athenian on Rome. And Gaius would also flaunt legal precedents. And when his armed supporters murdered an official, Gaius and 3,000 of his loyalists were butchered by the hands of the Senate. For centuries... Rome's complicated political system had ensured the peaceful transfer of power and compromise. Now, the door had been opened ajar to unconstitutional machinations, mob violence, and extrajudicial killings. And when future generations peeked through the opening, many saw power and riches, not the abyss right underneath them. The streets of Rome would run red with blood again when fierce rivals Marius and Sulla carried out deadly purges in their struggle for power. Marius was a successful general and six-time consul, and Sulla, his young protégé, looking to take over the top spot. Twice, Sulla breached an almost sacred taboo by marching troops on Rome to oust Marius, who himself had wiped his backside with constitutional principles from one last grab at that sweet, intoxicating power. When Sulla took possession of Rome for good, the gloves were off. 
he conjured up the ghost of Critias, and a prescription list was posted in the forum. Death squads butchered thousands of Roman citizens, including senators. Often, their decapitated heads would be brought to Sulla and then fitted to the speaker platform in the forum. There would be no live and let live when it came to Sulla's political opponents, real or imagined. The door opened to Jar by the Gracchi had now been kicked wide open by Marius and Sulla. And then Sulla took one step back from the abyss. He had been appointed dictator for life, then consul, and then he resigned. Might the Republic be safe? After Sulla and Marius, it would soon be time for the likes of Cicero and Caesar to dominate Roman politics. The traditional way to win honor and high office was through military success. But Marcus Tullius Cicero was a thinker, not a fighter. Much like Demosthenes, he would practice oratory and become the leading orator in the courts. He also fell in love with Greek philosophy, particularly Plato. So no wonder he didn't fancy democracy. His exploits as an orator saw Cicero race through the causes honorum that led to the top job as consul in 63 BC. A fateful year for Cicero and the Republic. For that was a year Cicero averted a plot by the latest self-professed champion of the people, Catiline, an ambitious politician who planned to exterminate the Senate and install a new populist regime. Although some historians think the Catiline conspiracy might have been inflated by a healthy dose of Cicero's own propaganda. But in his own version, Cicero got wind of the plot and apprehended the conspirators while Catiline was killed in a battle. But in saving the Republic from a coup d'etat, Cicero himself flaunted Republican principles and had the conspirators strangled without a trial. Cicero was hailed for his resolute action, but the use of draconian emergency powers would come back to haunt him. For the death of Catiline and his supporters had not exhausted the supply of populist demagogues. In 60 BC, the would-be dictator Julius Caesar and two other leading men had formed the so-called triumvirate that dominated Roman politics for years. Cicero declined to join the triumvirate. He feared its consequences for the Republic. But this made Cicero a potential stumbling block for the triumvirs and helped pave the way for one Publius Clodius Pulcher. Despite being a patrician, Clodius had been made a tribune of the plebs through the machinations of Caesar. Clodius soon overturned a ban on private associations. But he didn't aim at enriching Roman civil society with debating clubs. Instead, he established networks of armed thugs under his control. They used violence to intimidate the courts and assemblies. Where legal and political arguments had decided the outcome of justice and politics, Brute force now ruled supreme. Rome may have had the most powerful army in the world, but it didn't have a police force. No foreign enemy could withstand Rome's might, but the heart of the Republic was defenseless against an ultra-ambitious populist like Clodius, willing to use mob violence to advance his agenda. And part of his agenda was to utterly destroy that talking toker, Cicero. He had testified against Clodius in a prominent impiety case. Now Clodius would have his revenge. Using Cicero's illegal methods during the Catiline conspiracy as pretext, Clodius sent Cicero fleeing into exile. The only way to counter Clodius' gangs was to beat him at his own game. Up step Milo, a politician sympathetic to Cicero. If Clodius brought armed slaves to a fight, Milo brought gladiators. This balance of terror paved the way for Cicero's return and ultimately 
Clodius was killed. But the price was high, not only in terms of political violence. Cicero's return was secured at the price of his public support for the triumvirate he had opposed. This required conformity and self-censorship, a humiliation of the man who saw himself as the Republic's first defender. Inevitably, the triumvirate imploded, resulting in a bloody civil war from which Caesar emerged victorious in 48 BC. He would eventually be declared dictator for life. Caesar had given the Republic the final push into the abyss. Formally, Caesar was a mild dictator. Unlike Sulla, he didn't engage in prescriptions or widespread censorship only the odd banishment of those too critical. He even commissioned Rome's first public library. But the climate still became unhealthy for free speech. And unwillingly, Caesar also created a martyr for free speech on his way to absolute power. When Caesar had all but won the civil war, the infuriatingly principled senator Cato the Younger, not the misogynist, committed suicide rather than accept a pardon from Caesar, who desperately wanted the propaganda victory of showing clemency towards the Republic's staunchest defender. Ancient historian Cassius Dio adds a bit of color to Cato's dramatic exit from the stage of history. Before Cato stabbed himself and pulled out his own intestines, his son asked him why he didn't just accept the pardon. Cato replied, I, who have been brought up in freedom, with the right of free speech, cannot in my old age change and learn slavery instead. Cicero would also lament the new times. In a private letter, he wrote, If dignity consists in holding sound opinions on public affairs, mine is intact. But if it lies in the ability to advocate them freely, not a vestige of it is left. Cicero did write a book on oratory, ominously named Brutus, in honor of Caesar's would-be assassin. Brutus is a history of the great Greek and Roman orators. It includes a lot of veiled, and sometimes not so veiled, criticism of life under Caesar, under whom great oratory had died. The unstated premise was that free speech was incompatible with the dictatorship and only thrived under republicanism. On 15th March 44 BC, Caesar was stabbed to death in the Senate in a conspiracy including the liberators, Brutus and Cassius. The death of Caesar brought about years of bloody and treacherous civil war involving the liberators, Caesar's right-hand man, Arc Antony, and Caesar's young nephew, adopted son and heir, Octavian. We cannot delve into the high political drama changing alliances and famous battles. But despite some unease and many warnings, Cicero threw his support behind Octavian, thinking he could use Octavian to secure the Republic. He also used his rhetorical firepower to hammer away at Mark Antony in a number of speeches called Philippics, named after Demosthenes' speeches against Philip of Macedon. Like Demosthenes, Cicero mixed high-minded appeals to liberty with rhetorical kicks in the nuts. These two quotes are from the same speech recounted by Cassius Dio. First, Cicero the champion of the Republic. For I could not, on the one hand, endure to live under a monarchy or a tyranny, since under such a government I cannot live rightly as a free citizen, nor speak my mind safely. And then it was time to roll around the mud. Cicero accused Antony of all kinds of debauchery, including male prostitution, fornication, and drunkenness, before delivering the killer blow. 
It is impossible for a person brought up in so great licentiousness and shamelessness to avoid defiling his entire life. And so from his private life, he brought his lewdness and greed into his public relations. The long smear campaign worked, and ultimately the Senate declared Antony an enemy of the state. But by then, it was too late. For Cicero would soon find out that Octavian had been using him, not the other way around. Octavian, Mark Antony, and junior partner Marcus Lepidus formed a second triumvirate and defeated the liberators at the Battle of Philippi in 42 BC. But what had Cicero expected? Octavian was the heir of Caesar, not of Cato. Now, there was no crawling back up from the abyss. I love Cassius Dia's description of what was at stake at the Battle of Philippi. Now, as never before, liberty and popular government were the issues of the struggle. The one side was trying to lead them to autocracy, the other side to self-government. Hence, the people never attained again to absolute freedom of speech, even though vanquished by no foreign nation. Antony and Octavian revived the nightmares of Sulla's reign. Prescription was back on the menu. It was time to clear Rome of opposition once and for all. And nobody loomed larger than Cicero. Though for two days Octavian tried to get Cicero's name chalked off the list of condemned that would go up in the forum. But Antony only had to leave through Cicero's Philippics to fire up his murderous rage. In December 42, Cicero was intercepted by a death squad. He stoically stuck out his neck. His head and hands were cut off and brought back to an ecstatic Antony. According to Cassius Dio, Antony's wife Fulvia, also the ex-wife of Clodius, grabbed Cicero's head, pulled out the tongue that had lashed both her husband so viciously, and pierced it with her hairpin. Then, Cicero's chopped-off body parts were displayed at the speaker platform in the Forum. What stronger symbol of the death of the Republic than the humiliating display of the head and hands that had spoken and written so forcefully in its defense? And Antony also sought the head of Marcus Varro, an outstanding scholar and satirist, later known as the most learned of Romans. He's said to have written almost 500 books and collected an immense private library of knowledge in all fields. Varro managed to escape, but Antony had his library destroyed, and only a few of Varro's works survive. The Republic was dying, but Cicero and Cato would live on. Cicero would inspire thinkers in the Renaissance and Enlightenment, and in 1721, British writer Thomas Gordon wrote an essay on free speech published in the Cato's Letters, named in honor of Cato the Younger, and hugely influential with the founding fathers of the American Republic. In it, Gordon wrote glowingly of free speech during the Republic, and that Rome, with the loss of its liberty, lost also its freedom of speech. The following year, Gordon's article was republished in the New England Current in Boston, edited by a 16-year-old prodigy. His name, Benjamin Franklin. The second triumvirate was a marriage of convenience between three men who would only share power as long as necessary to eliminate all obstacles to the ultimate prize, sole possession of Rome. In 31 BC, Octavian defeated Antony at the Battle of Actium. He had cleared the way to become the first emperor of Rome, Emperor Augustus. Though he'd call himself Princeps, first citizen. It's unfair to judge Augustus' rule solely on his attitude to free speech. He famously remarked that he found Rome made of brick but left it of marble. And his so-called Pax Romana 
brought much-needed peace and stability, ending the vicious cycle of civil wars. That may have been worth a good chunk of Libertas for many Romans, so keep that in mind. In his biography of Augustus, Anthony Everett writes, One of the most remarkable features of the Augustan regime was that speech remained free. But that's a truth with significant modifications. In fact, Augustus would mold the matrix that slowly but steadily bled political speech dry of dissent. Augustus had already cleared much opposition through the prescriptions. So he could afford a piecemeal transformation to autocracy, keeping republican institutions in place, though depriving them of much real power. Against the advice of his successor Tiberius, Augustus would allow pro-republican and anti-monarchical pamphlets, as well as dissent in the Senate. Do not be swayed by youthful ardor, my dear Tiberius, into too great a rage over the fact that there are people who speak ill of me, for it is sufficient for us to have the power to prevent them from doing us any harm. But Augustus' tolerance of free speech only went so far as it was deemed advantageous. His subversion of free speech was initially subtle. Much like many modern autocrats no longer summarily execute political dissidents, but target them through monopolizing media, laws aimed at terrorism, or spurious charges of tax evasion that provide a facade of legitimacy. One of Augustus' first decisions was to put the protocols from the senatorial meetings, the so-called acta senatus, under strict governmental censorship. Dissent should not be aired. Then he responded to a number of anti-monarchical pamphlets by declaring anonymous literary attacks against anyone, not just Augustus, illegal. In 12 BC, Augustus proclaimed himself Pontifex Maximus, high priest of Rome, and in that capacity, not as princeps, he ordered more than 2,000 religious scrolls, pamphlets and books to be burned. Fortune tellers might be tempted to foresee the death of the current emperor and fall of the regime, and their clients might be tempted to help fulfill the prophecies. But with time, book burnings would also engulf secular writings. A fundamental change happened after a great famine and a series of fires in 6 to 8 AD that prompted the circulation of pamphlets criticizing the regime. Augustus, perhaps under influence from Tiberius, sought to suppress the dissent with legal basis in two traditions. The ancient Twelve Tables prohibition of defamation and the so-called Lex Maestatis against treason. By changing the scope of the Lex Maestatis, Augustus dealt a crippling blow to free speech. The law used to cover acts such as betraying an army and incitement to sedition. Actions were prosecuted, words were immune, wrote Tacitus. But at the drop of a hat, Augustus widened the scope to cover slanderous writings. What historian Frederick H. Kramer called literary treason was now a punishable crime. Again, the parallel to modern authoritarian states who prosecute journalists and political opponents for terrorism or treason is striking. With this new crime came a new penalty, book burnings. In mild cases, only some works of the guilty writer would be consumed by the flames. But in graver ones, the whole life work was incinerated, which must have been devastating in the days before the printing press, or the cloud. But Augustus didn't stop there. Private possession and even reading banned books was prohibited. The first victim of the new practice was likely a professor named Titus Labinius. He was a pretty controversial guy who pushed his luck a little too far. According to the writer Seneca the Elder, who sat in on some of the professor's lectures, his attacks on the Augustan order were so vehement that he earned the nickname Rabinius the Rabbit. A controversial outsider, 
Labinius was the perfect victim for establishing the new precedent of literary treason. His entire works were condemned to the flames. Seneca immediately realized the disastrous implications for free speech, but still managed to see the silver lining. It is indeed a blessing for the public that this cruel form of punishing talents was invented after the time of Cicero. For what would have happened if it had been in the power of the triumvirs to prescribe even the talent of a Cicero? Far better indeed that such executions of talents have begun only in an age which the talents have deserted. The great orator Cassius Severus defended Labinius in an obituary worthy of Cato. If they really want to destroy the works of Labinius, they must burn me alive, for I have learned them by heart. Severus' words were interpreted a little more literally than intended, for he was next in line. Not only were his entire works burned, he was also exiled to Crete, and later, since he just wouldn't shut up, his property and citizen rights were taken away. But things would get worse, much worse, when Augustus died and Tiberius took over in 14 AD. Tiberius started out as a relatively humble and tolerant ruler. He refused to take action when mocked in public, stressing the importance of free speech. Let them have their fun. But the overbearing smile and mild manners hit a paranoid and cruel personality. Soon, Tiberius' Dr. Jekyll would be smothered by his Mr. Hyde. And when unleashed, it wasn't long before book burnings were the least to worry about for literary traders. The first victims of capital punishment were members of that most hazardous profession, astrologers and fortune tellers. One was hurled to death from the Capitol Hill, another whipped and beheaded. This makes you wonder about the quality of Roman astrologers. If they were so good at foreseeing the future, why hadn't they fled? Foreign religions were also prohibited their followers exiled and their books burned. The Senate was reined in and torture was introduced in cases of speech crimes. The prosecution of literary treason soon reached a point where Tiberius' paranoia turned totalitarian. Tacitus writes, Every crime was treated as capital, even the utterance of a few simple words. In 21 AD, two more poets were executed one for a poem anticipating the death of Tiberius' sickly son, Drusus. Nothing serves as a better illustration of Tiberius' extreme intolerance than the famous case against the pro-Republican historian Aulus Cremutius Cordus in 25 AD. His crime? A historical treatise that praised Caesar's assassins, Brutus and Cassius, as the last Romans. Literary treason had never before been brought against a historical work. It was, in the words of Tacitus, a new charge for the first time heard. Cremucci's own account has not survived. But like Plato's apology recounting Socrates' trial, Tacitus provides an account of Cremucci's own defense. The charge, conscript fathers, is for my words only. So irreproachable is my conduct. You may sentence me to death. But then, not only Brutus and Cassius will be remembered. I, too, shall not be forgotten. Cremucius left the Senate, and where Socrates drank poison, Cremucius starved himself to death, while his books were burned and the reading and possession of his writings prohibited. Tacitus praised Cremucius as a martyr of free speech. Through persecution, the reputation of the persecuted talents grow stronger. Foreign despots and all those who have used the same barbarous methods have only succeeded in bringing disgrace upon themselves and glory to their victims. Fast forward 2,000 years and many countries, including some democracies, 
still criminalize unofficial historical accounts. The autocracy of the Principate did come with a silver lining. The rule of Augustus coincides with what is known as the Golden Age of Latin literature, counting some of the most renowned writers and poets of the Roman world, Virgil, Ovid, and Horace, just to name a few. Among the beautiful words, it's also possible to find veiled speech with barbs aimed at perceived injustices. Take of its extremely influential Metamorphoses, where he retells the Greek myth of Philomela. Philomela was raped by her sister's husband, King Tyreus, who also cut out her tongue so she couldn't tell her story. Philomela breaks free from her censorship by wowing her story onto a rope and sending it to her sister. The women exacted the most gruesome revenge by serving Tyreus his own son for dinner. To escape from Tereo's wrath, the gods transformed Philomela into a nightingale. Maybe so she could sing her story? And perhaps the story could also be interpreted as a comment on censorship in the Roman Empire. But even great poets were not immune to repression. In 8 AD, Ovid was exiled to a small island by Augustus. Ovid only tells us that the banishment was due to a song or poem and an error. Some scholars think it may have been Ovid's poem, The Art of Love, that provoked Augustus, who cracked down hard on immorality. This is a modernized translation of part of the poem. I hate sex that doesn't provide release for both. That's why the touch of boys is less desirable. I hate a girl who gives because she has to, and arid herself thinks only of her spinning. Pleasure's no joy to me, that's given out of duty. Let no girl be dutiful to me. The common people also had a medium for veiled speech, the animal fable. By letting animals speak and act, the fables are a clever way of circumventing censorship and veiling critique of society. Phaedrus was an ex-slave from the imperial household of Tiberius, so it's perhaps not surprising that Phaedrus' fables always take the perspective of the underdogs. He wants us to root for the frogs and sheep against the lions and wolves. The fable of the swallow and the serpent can be seen as a veiled attack against inequality. A swallow has built a nest with seven eggs in the wall of a courtroom. One day, the swallow returns to a horrible surprise. A serpent has eaten all her eggs, and it happened right there under the judge's noses. Historian Mary Baird interprets the fable as a critique of how the law protects some, but not others. With Tiberius' totalitarian persecution of literary treason, political dissent withered away. The next big clash of ideas would be over religion. If Tiberius had consulted some of those oracles he banished, they might have warned him that the importance of Cremutius' trial would be trivial compared to another trial that took place in the province of Judea. Though the details are unclear and myth and reality difficult to separate, the trial of Jesus of Nazareth would set off events with radical consequences for the Roman Empire. Next episode, we'll see how the Romans treated the new cult of Christians and how the Christians treated pagans and each other once Christianity became the state religion of the empire. Thank you so much for listening. Today's episode was edited by Søren Steihøj and Matthias Meyer assisted with valuable research. As always, please check out freespeechhistory.com for more details and sources. And please do contact me on Facebook, Twitter or email. And if you like what you heard, 
A review on iTunes would be fabulous.